and welcome. My name is Sarah Shore, and I am the Senior Symposium Editor for the American University Law Review. I want to welcome you all to our annual symposium, The Impact of Race on Youth Injustice. If you would like closed captioning, that is available on the bottom of your screen under live captioning. Each year, the Law Review dedicates its annual symposium to exploring a burgeoning area in the legal field, and several events in recent history have brought to the forefront the issue of race and racism in the legal profession. Almost every sector of the law has and continues to confront racism, but children are uniquely situated by the fact that essentially every decision made for them is made by other people. Today, as we explore these questions, we hope to shed some light on how racism has infiltrated the legal rights of children. And significantly, it is not lost on me that this event takes place during Black History Month. Before we begin, I would like to take a moment to thank the Law Review staff and our editorial board for their support and assistance in making this event a reality. In particular, I would like to thank our senior projects editor, Emily Thomas, and our editor-in-chief, Margaret Smiley Chavez. Without Emily and Margaret, there would not have been a symposium, and I'm eternally grateful for their support, encouragement, and partnership. Usually, this event would be hosted in person at the law school. However, in order to protect the health and safety of all of our participants and attendees, our symposium looks a little different this year. To avoid the Zoom, Zoom, Zoom fatigue that we've all become so familiar with over the past two years, the symposium will have several breaks throughout the day. We will be begin this morning with some opening remarks from Dean Fairfax, and then move into an incredible panel on the effective transformations within the juvenile legal system, followed by a 30 minute break. And then we will then move into our keynote address by Donnell Drinks of the Campaign for the Fair Sentencing of Youth. After a lunch break, we will then have a conversation looking at the creation, impact, and future of the backlog of special immigrant juvenile status applications. And after a final 30 minute break, finish out the day looking at the tension between power and freedom for kids and families involved in the family regulation system. I hope you all will be able to join us for all of the panels today. You should have received a Zoom link for each individual panel in your registration email. If for some reason you did not, please email Emily Thomas. She will put her email in the Zoom chat. To formally open our symposium, I would like to introduce WCL's Dean, Dean Roger A. Fairfax, Jr. Dean Fairfax is Dean and Professor of Law at the American University Washington College of Law, and he's held this position since 2021. As a prominent legal scholar, educator, and nationally known expert on criminal justice, he previously served as the Patricia Roberts Harris research professor and founding director of the Criminal Law and Policy Initiative at George Washington University Law School. Dean Fairfax's scholarship has been published in books and leading journals, and he has taught courses and conducted research on criminal law and procedure, professional responsibility and ethics, criminal justice policy and reform, racial justice, and grand jury and internal investigations. He has championed diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts throughout higher education and the legal profession. Dean Fairfax has already had a profound impact on WCL, and the American University Law Review is so fortunate to have him here with us. With that said, it is my sincere pleasure to introduce Dean Roger A. Fairfax, Jr. Well, good morning, and thank you, sir, for that kind introduction and for allowing me to welcome everyone to the American University Law Review's annual symposium. Um, I, I'm profoundly grateful to you and, and the entire Law Review team for all of your hard work and your commitment to shed light on this critical topic and as someone who has devoted the better part of my career to seeking um, justice, including racial justice and youth justice, I am thrilled that the American University Washington College of Law is able to host the Law Review's convening today. It was actually two years ago this month that I brought to D.C. Mr. Raymond Santana, one of the exonerated five, who shared with the convening his tragic story of the intersection of racial injustice and obviously injustice toward uh, youth. And, and that event, which also featured our own Professor Angela Jordan Davis and one of the members of our first panel, Professor Kristen Henning, was sobering, but it, but it left us with hope. And that was the hope that Mr. Santana encouraged us all to maintain and to use as fuel to do what we can to help train and inspire the next generation of justice seekers. So I want to thank our wonderful panelists representing the breadth of juvenile justice fields, including the legal system and immigration and family regulation for participating in this event. And the WCL faculty moderators and students and I are looking forward to your rich and insightful conversations. 
Uh, and today we're honored, as, as Zara mentioned, to welcome keynote speaker Donnell Drinks, uh, the Leadership Development and Engagement Coordinator of the Campaign for the Fair Sensing of Youth. And you're going to hear his remarkable story a little later, but for now, I just want to thank Mr. Drinks for being with us. And it's now my privilege to, to help introduce the panelists for today's first session, Effective Transformations in the juvenile legal system. Now, all three panelists have platinum coded resumes and, and I won't go into detail here and I think you're gonna hear some more about their background soon, but please read the bios of these three remarkable individuals, um, including Carl Racine, the first elected attorney general of the District of Columbia. And attorney general Racine has promoted a data-driven juvenile justice reform effort in the district and has launched a path-breaking restorative justice program within the office of the Attorney General. And, and again, he has platinum credentials. Uh, with only one blemish on his otherwise sterling resume, he graduated from St. John's High School rather than Carroll High School in Northeast DC, which is the greatest high school in the country. But, but even we Carroll grads are proud of you, Mr. Attorney General, for all you're doing for DC. And it, it is truly an honor to have you here at WCL today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. For not everybody, uh, not everybody, Dean Fairfax could get into St. John's. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. We're working on it. We're working on it. Uh, and we also have Professor Kristen Henning, who's director of the Juvenile Justice Clinic, uh, the initiative uh, as well, and also the Bloom Professor of Law at the George Washington. Man. George Washington. I'm sorry. I was blasphemy. I know. I know. I'm sorry. I take that back. Uh, at the Georgetown University Law Center. Um, and Professor Henning, who is a, a dear friend of, uh, and I won't mention how many years, but we're, we're now up to three decades now, um, uh, has a new critically acclaimed book, uh, The Rage of Innocence, How America Criminalizes Black Youth. And she will in fact be back here at WCL in three weeks when I will engage with her in a fireside chat uh, about that amazing book and about her phenomenal career advocating for racial justice in the juvenile justice arena. So we will see her again soon and we are fortunate to have her here today. And uh, last but not least, we have Professor Kim Taylor Thompson, who is Professor of Clinical Law Emerita at the New York University School of Law. And professor Taylor Thompson, among her many, many uh, accomplishments, uh, founded the criminal justice program at the Brennan Center for Justice uh, and as a former director of the DC Public Defender Service as are two of our WCL faculty members, Professor Angela Jordan Davis and Professor Cynthia Jones. And I first learned of Professor Taylor Thompson and her work through my mentor and law professor Charles Ogletree. And I was one of his research assistants. And through that work, I was introduced to the brilliance of uh, Professor Taylor Thompson's scholarly and advocacy work in these important areas. And she is someone I have long admired. So again, it is an honor um, to have uh, her here today. And this uh, a panel will be moderated by my wonderful faculty colleague and fellow avid basketball fan, Professor Benny Miller, uh, who is co-director of the Criminal Justice Clinic and is professor of law here at WCL. So again, thank you all for joining us and for supporting the American University Washington College of Law and the American University Law Review, and please enjoy this important symposium. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you so much, Dean Fairfax. That was that was a great introductory some introductory remarks. We now will move into a fascinating conversation, as Dean Fairfax said, with some of the country's leading experts in the juvenile legal system. Um, Dean Fairfax did a great job introducing them, so I will go ahead and turn it over to you, Professor Miller, to get this conversation started. Okay, thank you very much, Sarah, and welcome everyone. I am uh, thrilled and humbled to be moderating this panel of such amazing people who I've admired for years. Um, I think the job of a moderator is to really just get the ball rolling, to listen, to field questions, and pretty much otherwise stay out of the way, particularly with a panel like this one. So I will just briefly introduce how we're gonna uh, proceed today. We'll start with Professor Henning, who's gonna talk about um, the front end of the system, policing youth. We'll then move to Professor Taylor Thompson, who's going to talk about the racialized choice to prosecute children as adults. 
And then we'll move to Attorney General Racine, who's going to be talking about the Office of the Attorney General's approach to addressing juvenile crime and why we need to work together on sustainable public safety strategies. Um, so with that, um, we'll have some questions after each of them has um, finished their remarks. We should have lots of time for audience engagement. So we'll start with uh, Professor Henning. Thank you, Benny. I'm so happy to be here with you all. Thank you, Dean Fairfax. Thank you, Sarah. Um, it is wonderful uh, to be on a panel with some great friends, superstars <laughs> uh, in the field. And so I look forward to their comments. But um, as Professor uh, Miller said, we thought we would start off at the front end of the system. And when we're thinking about effective transformation of the juvenile legal system, we want to talk about policing and particularly policing and race. So as a foundation, I think we could all agree that we want public safety. Every single one of us wants to be safe. But the strategy or the, 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 what we have to do as a community is figure out how to get there in the safest and most equitable way possible. Or I should say the most effective um, and equitable way possible. Um, and what we see today in the juvenile legal system is traditional law enforcement responses to adolescent behaviors that are short-sighted, ineffective, and quite frankly, deeply rooted in bias. And I think you're going to hear that um, throughout our segment today. So um, any reform on the policing side, on the front end of the system, must start with a recognition of the cost that are associated with traditional policing and law enforcement approaches. So I think the best way to start us off is for me to just tell a story um, as an example, a story of a young person that I represented, all right? So I represented a child um, who we'll call Tarek. Tarek lives in an apartment in Washington, DC, and um, he likes to visit friends and family who live in the apartment building right next door. So one Saturday morning at 10 a.m., he goes out to visit his neighbors. Just as he reaches the end of his walkway and is about to turn onto the sidewalk, he looks up and sees a police car with two police officers in it looking at him. The sight of those police officers caused him to hesitate, right, and created the slightest break in his step. Um, the police officers referred to this as a stutter step, um, at which point the police officers pull up to the sidewalk, ride up on the curb and get out to walk towards him. My client, 16 year old Tarek, takes off running. The officers chase him and he hides behind a bush, which is my favorite part of the story, right? Like the, he can't be seen behind this bush, but he hides behind the bush and the police officers grab him and begin yelling, why are you running? Why are you running? To which he replies, because you are chasing me. And this is just the classic exchange that you see between Black children in particular and police officers throughout the country. And so if you don't live in a neighborhood um, that is heavily surveilled by the police, um, and if you haven't done anything wrong, you may be wondering why in the world is Tart running from the police? Right, um, and uh, and especially if you if you and Tart haven't done anything wrong, but what we don't realize is just how pervasive policing is in contemporary America, especially in the black the and brown uh, neighborhoods. Awesome. Right, um, and so we take it for granted that we all can walk through our communities and our neighborhoods without undue intrusion from the police. We value our right to privacy. Um, but this is not a luxury that many black and brown children have in certain neighborhoods in our country. 
there are now generations of Black and Latinx youth in particular who have grown up under the constant surveillance of police officers. In many neighborhoods, police are parked on the corner, drive through the neighborhood at all hours of the day and night, asking young people where they're going, where they're coming from. Um, and we just don't recognize how traumatic those experiences are. But there is a growing body of research, empirical research documenting just how traumatic policing is. Studies show that young people who are the target of excessive stops and frisks and who live in these heavily surveilled neighborhoods have high rates of fear, anxiety, depression, hopelessness, and they become hypervigilant. Um, meaning simply that they're always on guard, not trusting uh, police officers and other adult authority figures in their lives. And research also shows that um, this trauma, these traumatic effects occur not only from being the direct target of, these, uh, of this police aggression, but also from witnessing it or hearing about it from friends and family and someone who's close to them. So truly just having to worry about getting up in the morning at seven, excuse me, at 10 a.m. on a Saturday morning, just having to worry about being the victim of some police aggression um, like Tark believed. And so I invite us to think about what it's like even to watch police encounters and police aggression on the television or the internet, even involving people we do not know. So the watching of uh, the killing of George Floyd on television had a profound effect, I hope, on every single one one of us. But I invite you to think about what that would be like to watch that killing if you are a teenage African-American boy who knows that that can happen to you. It's a profoundly different experience for you. And then what's really important as we think about the cost and the harms of traditional law enforcement approaches is for us to remember that adolescence is a time when our initial impressions of the law and law enforcement become fixed in our minds. So early negative encounters with the police have a profound and long lasting impact on how we think about and how young people think about and engage with law enforcement as they transition to adulthood, right? And some of them who have these negative experiences begin to question whether it's even worth it to participate in mainstream society. So that's a really important framework, the cost of traditional law enforcement. And so when we think about, I love the title of this, um, this, this conference today, the symposium today, Effective Transformation of the Juvenile Legal System. Um, at the front end, we have to talk about how we radically reduce the footprint of police officers in the lives of children especially black and brown children who have been so disproportionately targeted. And that is one of the many ways that we'll talk about, but one of the ways in which we shrink the size of the juvenile legal system, all right? And so how do we radically reduce the footprint of police in the lives of, of children? One is the police free schools movement, um, replacing police officers with a public health approach to safety. Um, and so, you know, I invite you all, if we want to talk about that more in the Q&A, um, definitely let's talk about, you know, policing in schools. Um, but that's just one of the ways. It's not as radical as it sounds, all right? Another way that we can think about um, reducing the footprint of police in the lives of, of children is decriminalizing certain normal adolescent behaviors, both inside the school system and outside the school system. Across the country, we see young people arrested for disturbing schools, basically for being kids, right? Um, for disorderly conduct, for adolescent aggressive speech, for talking back, and to be quite frank, for experimenting with things that many of you out there, dare I say all of you out there have experimented with, experimenting with drugs, right? Um, engaging in, you know, uh, sexual activity, maybe in ways that we regret later when we reflect back on them, right? But decriminalizing normal adolescents and particularly among black and brown youth who are perceived to be more dangerous than they actually are. 
um, we can radically reduce the footprint of police in the lives of, of black and brown children by um, thinking strategically about our laws and the, the ways in which we grant permission in our society for young people, I mean, for police officers to stop young people on the street. So what laws can we rewrite? What laws can we revamp um, for all of you out there in, in, in uh, of the law school uh, environment? So thinking about prohibiting what we call consent searches by young people, meaning that we prohibit the practice of allowing police officers to walk up to a teenager and say, can I search you? Um, and we know so much of those, uh, so many of those requests are deeply rooted in racial profiling. Um, we need to reduce stop and frisk throughout the country. And maybe we reduce that stop and frisk practice by requiring probable cause, going back to the origins and, and, and requiring probable cause to believe that that child has engaged in some felony before any kind of contact with a young person takes place. And of course, we've got to take comprehensive steps to reduce racial bias among uh, law enforcement and among uh, um, and reduce and eliminate profiling, right? So new anti-racial profiling provisions, training for developmentally appropriate policing that requires police officers to uh, participate in trainings on adolescent development, implicit racial bias, adolescent de-escalation, regulations that eliminate use of force. So I could go on and on, but I, I wanted to lay out the framework of the front end of the system and all of the work that we have to do if we are serious about effectively transforming the juvenile legal system. So I'm gonna kick it back to Professor Miller to, to take us a little deeper into the, to the system. And I am happy um, to uh, answer questions more about the front end and any other part of the juvenile legal system. Thank you very much, Professor Henning. Um, we'll now turn to Professor Taylor Thompson to talk about the racialized choice to prosecute children as adults. Thank you, Professor Miller. And thank you, Dean Fairfax and Sarah Shore. Um, I am so pleased to be part of this panel and I'm looking forward to the conversation. It's just an amazing group of folks who are um, really thinking about some troubling issues. 26 years ago, Professor John Diulio created and disseminated one of the most dangerous and lethal lies in our history, the super predator theory. He depicted black children as wolf packs of animals who, were, uh, who had no remorse. And make no mistake, predator is a binary concept. If there's a predator, there's prey. Professor Diulio insisted that this supposed younger, more dangerous breed of offender would soon prey on upscale areas, suburban areas, rural areas. His warning was clear, white America was in danger. And the response was swift and unrelenting. The media quickly exploited and promoted his claims. Politicians in both parties passed draconian crime bills and the public eagerly consumed this story. The super predator lie went viral, infecting every single institution that touches children. And in the end, it robbed black children of their youth and the protection of childhood. But the super predator forecast was pure fiction. The crime wave that Giulio predicted never materialized. Juvenile crime rates actually at the time dropped during that period. But that didn't slow politicians who simply ignored the data and pushed adult time for adult crime. And when John DiUlio actually admitted being wrong, even that re retraction couldn't dislodge this country's belief that young black males were cold-blooded and dangerous. And today, every state still prosecutes middle schoolers as adults, exposing them to adult prosecution and punishment. The overwhelming majority of those kids are Black. Children as young as eight have been prosecuted as adults. So what's the reason for this? Well, to put it plainly, Black children are not perceived as valuable and instead are treated as expendable in this country. We love to claim that justice is blind, but on a daily basis, we see that the experience of justice in this country is shaped and misshaped by race. 
That is the case even for the most vulnerable among us, our children. Race is the indelible dividing line that cleaves the nation into two competing visions of who is dangerous, who is not, who counts as a child, and who does not. So let's unpack that a bit. In, in our justice system, Black children face a triple threat. The first is dehumanization, where we suggest that young people of color just aren't human. They're animals, they're vicious, they're predatory. Dehumanization is a process that permits us to believe that certain individuals and groups fall outside the boundary where moral rules and values um, apply. And once we make that designation, we can then take action against that group without the tug of moral restraint, right? So if the person, person is a vicious animal, we feel no compunction removing that vicious person from society. If the offender is seen as vermin, we can exterminate and not think twice, right? The second threat to Black children is an exaggerated perception of their physical size and dangerousness. Empirical studies have shown that people misjudge the size and strength, particularly of young Black men, perceiving them as larger and as more fearsome than young white men of comparable size and build. Studies show that that misperception then leads us to the belief that aggressive policing and formal control are warranted given that perception of dangerousness. And finally, the third threat is adultification. Young black boys and girls are routinely perceived as older than their actual chronological age. In a groundbreaking series of empirical studies, Professor Phil Goff tested whether Black boys experience fewer protections because they seem less distinct from adults. And our own Professor Henning conducted similar studies looking at the adultification of Black girls, finding that we overestimate the age of Black girls as well. The data that they collected is startling and sobering. Survey respondents perceived that Black girls across all age ranges were more adult than white girls at almost all stages of development. As early as five years old, Black girls were seen as behaving older than their actual age. The bottom line is that these three threats prematurely strip Black children of the protections of childhood, which can have dangerous ramifications for them in the justice context. Now, I'm going to talk a moment about uh, the scientific basis for recognizing children as developmentally distinct from adults. And I know that Attorney General Racine is going to touch on this in his comments, but let me just make a couple of points here. Neuroscience confirms that young people's brains are still developing into their mid to late 20s. Yep, that includes a lot of you who are listening. And, and behavioral science shows that young people engage in risky behavior because they do not yet exercise judgment as a more mature person might. Data also confirms that young people have a great capacity for change and that the majority will age out of offending and lead law abiding lives. The US Supreme Court, to its credit, has embraced the science which led them to outlaw the imposition of the death penalty when someone is under 18 and to condemn the mandatory imposition of life without parole for homicides for youth offenders. So there, there's some good news. But the bad news is that race too often trumps science. Because even though the US Supreme Court recommends that court actors take youthfulness into consideration, as a mitigating factor in charging and sentencing decisions, not all kids are getting the benefit of that youth discount. Instead, we see a, a disturbing form of racial exceptionalism in play. Rather than being seen as a still developing child, the young black person is more often seen as fully formed and adult-like. He's not impulsive, he's unpredictably violent. He doesn't fail to appreciate risks and consequences. He's thoughtless, he's callous. What the court outlines as mitigating factors are misperceived as indicators of dangerousness once we overlay race. Black adolescents are then more easily denied rehabilitative care or diversionary treatment, even when they have engaged in the exact same criminal behavior as white adolescents. So what can be done? What can be done to change this narrative and to change the course of racialized injustice for the black offender? One player in the system has considerable power to transform the treatment of young offenders in the justice system, and that's the prosecutor. 
you know, as you know from your own Professor Angela Davis in her powerful scholarship, prosecutors hold an important justice key. They make life altering decisions on a daily basis. It's their job. But too often, prosecutors know precious little about the person who has been charged and the traumas that they've experienced, as Professor Henning was outlining. And they don't recognize that their lives may and their behavior may be caused by that trauma. Too often, prosecutors see the uh, young Black people who appear before them as no more than the worst thing that they've ever done. But it is the responsibility of the prosecutor to see them more fully, to be more proximate, and to be alert to the racial dynamics at play. So if prosecutors um, want to enhance fairness, there are a number of things that they can do. And we can talk about a lot of those in the Q&A if you like. But let me talk about one. Prosecutors should be skeptical about juvenile confessions. Confessions are generally seen as powerful indicators of guilt. After all, why would an innocent person risk prison or worse um, by falsely incriminating himself? But the truth about false confessions is that kids make confessions, false confessions all the time. Children and adolescents are two to three times more likely than adults to confess falsely. In a study of 340 exonerations that have taken place since 1989, researchers found that people under 18 were three times as likely to make false confessions. 42% of juvenile exonerees had confessed to a crime that they had not committed, in contrast to only 13% of wrongfully convicted adults. Why does this happen? Police can exploit a child's emotions and susceptibility to pressure and suggestion. For example, by promising the young person a short-term reward, like you'll get out if you just say you did this, police effectively play into the developmental vulnerabilities that characterize young people. That false promise, which is legally permissible, can fundamentally derail a young person's life. So in closing, let me say that choosing who counts as a child continues to be steeped in this country's racism. When a white 17-year-old Kyle Rittenhouse opened fire on protesters in Kenosha, Wisconsin, killing two protesters this past summer, pundits and political operators, uh, uh, operatives were quick to describe him as a little boy out there trying to protect his community. Even when he walked past police toting a semi-automatic rifle, police did not stop or question him. A black 17 year old armed with a semi automatic would not have lived to tell the story. But Rittenhouse was not perceived as dangerous. He was seen as a child. And of course, he was acquitted at trial. Contrast that with Tamir Rice. A Cleveland police officer sized up Tamir in an instant. He considered him dangerous, shooting and killing Tamir within two seconds of getting out of his patrol car. Tamir was a 12 year old black child playing with a toy gun. Our inability to see Tamir as a child cost him his life. Transformation can begin with the decision to stop altogether referring children into the adult criminal justice system, because it is the best way to ensure that Black children get the benefit of the doubt that we instinctively give white children. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Taylor Thompson. We'll now turn to Attorney General Racine. Um, and he'll be talking about the OAG's, the Office of the Attorney General's approach to addressing juvenile crime in ways we can all work together. Thank you very much. Let me first thank uh, the American University uh, Law School for convening this uh, extraordinary panel, uh, folks who I admire, folks who I read, uh, prolific and important uh, writers on issues around kids in particular how black and brown kids are, are treated in the juvenile system. And I think as we saw from both Professor Henning's remarks as well as uh, Professor Taylor's remarks, the prosecutor really has an important role to play uh, in the prosecution of juvenile justice. And that prosecutor should be steeped in concepts of trauma, of adolescent brain development, um, prospects like cognitive behavioral therapy, restorative justice, and other known successful techniques that embrace children, that hold children accountable, but also allow for children to get the services that they need 
should they enter the criminal justice system in a way that would better assure that they do not return. Let me talk about the, the prosecutors at the Office of Attorney General and what we sought to do. First, as the speakers have discussed, the prosecutor plays an extraordinary role. It is the prosecutor who decides whether or not to first bring a charge. In the District of Columbia, we've gone even one step in advance of that. Um, for nearly two years now, working with the Metropolitan Police Department, we argued and then persuaded them to actually call us on a 1-800 line, no matter what time of day it is, to, to get advice on whether they had enough facts or the circumstances suggested that indeed they could arrest a child. This hotline is up and quite active. And I can tell you, by virtue of having that discussion with the police on a scene, at a scene, we have brought in kids who had to be arrested, and we've oftentimes counseled the police in a way um, that resulted in a non-arrest. Once a child is arrested, the prosecutor has the obligation to independently review the evidence that the police have brought and determine whether there is sufficient evidence and whether the evidence was procured in a constitutional way to justify a charge. The next decision, and let me just emphasize here, of course, proof in the juvenile system uh, in order for a assessment that a child was involved in wrongdoing is beyond a reasonable doubt. And it is often the case that the quantum of evidence presented to prosecutors simply falls short of the standard required to charge the child. The other things we do at the Office of Attorney General is we take a hard look at what was going on in the life of the young person, understanding, as the speakers have previously made clear, that in a real way, kids in their brains, particularly their frontal lobe, major, under major construction, still developing. And when you have a kid whose brain is still developing, you have a child who is more apt to be impulsive. As the speakers correctly noted, age does uh, allow um, some maturing and development of cognitive thinking abilities such that a child becomes less impulsive and is thinking more about the consequences of a potential misstep or misjudgment. Now, with respect to diversion, and I wanna make it clear that this Office of Attorney General has diverted thousands of young people who came into the system. We don't just uh, divert them and give them a chocolate bar and a Gatorade and say, you're on your way. Not at all. Instead, what we do is we dig in with the young person, their family, the school, anyone who is supporting the child. And we try to find out what is going on in that child's life. There's a process uh, called uh, the uh, adverse childhood experience questions that are asked, so-called ACE questions. Those ACE questions go at the heart of what trauma the child may have suffered, and indeed that trauma could have impacted the decisions that the child made that brought the child into the system. I can tell you, having performed thousands of ACE examinations on young people, the overwhelming majority of kids who come into the system are literally high stressed, impulsive. In short, their flight and fear mechanism is idling quite high. And so the first thing that needs to be done is you need to calm them down. You can't go to school and learn if you're always on heightened awareness. And so bringing them down is an important part of diversion. Diversion also explores the, the young child's specific talents, not just deficits. And then through diversion, we seek to match that young child's talent with services that can help. Let me give you an example of an 11 year old, and I cannot tell you uh, that person's name, of course, because the system in the juvenile uh, cases is confidential. 
but a young child, quite impulsive, and frankly, pretty much always ready to be physical, went through the diversion program, uh, through the diversion program, met a series of adults, and was introduced to boxing. That young man gained immense discipline from boxing regimen. That was his primary focus. Sure enough, in addition to cognitive behavioral therapy, um, he went to boxing class every day. And what did we see? We saw the young man extending the discipline of boxing into attendance at school, better performance at school. Now, of course, he was spending time with responsible adults who absolutely cared about him. Shortly thereafter, of course, the young, young boy started having a better sense about himself today and a better sense about his prospects tomorrow. All that in a six month diversion. And as I indicated, we've diverted thousands of kids. And I can tell you that 75% of the kids who've gone through the diversion program have not returned to the criminal justice system. So this is a demonstrable evidence-based um, application of creativity that seeks to support a child, not unduly punish a child as an adult. A second form of creative creativity and a second approach that we utilize in appropriate circumstances at the Office of Attorney General uh, is restorative justice. Restorative justice, in short, is a way to put the keys of the justice system in the hands of the victim. And if the victim agrees, what happens is the victim is supported by allies of her or he, and the accused is also supported by his or her allies, teachers, faith-based folks, friends, family. After several uh, sessions, the two youth come together and talk about what occurred, the harm that occurred to the victim. These sessions, I wanna tell you, are extremely emotional. At the end of the session, it is the victim in conversation with the accused, both supported by people who love them, who comes up with an appropriate resolution and an agreement that the offender must agree to. Once the offender agrees to that resolution, the offender must complete the promises he or she has made. Once those promises have been met, the case goes away. We are now uh, working with the third party uh, to validate uh, our data, uh, to use a control group, uh, to ascertain whether we're having an impact on recidivism, something I'm gonna focus on in a minute. I can tell you that the early returns are indeed demonstrating that not only is restorative justice highly valued by victims, but it's also highly valued by offenders. And as to recidivism, the early data suggests that kids who go through uh, restorative justice are far less likely uh, to commit another crime. Again, evidence-based solutions that bring accountability for sure, but also bring much needed creative, restorative, reparative services that can uplift the child and set the child up for a better future. Isn't that what a rehabilitative system is all about? I'll stop there and look forward to any questions or engagement with my excellent panelists. Thank you very much, Attorney General Racine. I have a couple of questions here in my back pocket. I'll ask the first one, or maybe it's my front pocket, I'm not sure. Uh, I'll ask the first one of Attorney General Racine and then save my others to see what questions come out of the, um, the Q&A. So um, for Attorney General Racine, um, you've obviously been involved in your work as, as the Attorney General in these questions of juvenile justice, but I'm very interested in um, kind of what earlier in your career, um, uh, before you took office, what 
what really inspired you mm. to care about these issues, both in your own life, on behalf of the citizens of the District of Columbia? Sure. Uh, well, I, I, I would cite two sources uh, as having been um, you know, strong motivators uh, for me. Um, the first, frankly, is I grew up in Washington, D.C., and uh, my parents um, and I came from Haiti. Uh, my mother and father left Haiti uh, when I was about six months old. It took them three years or so to get established here in DC. And then once they got established, they sent for my sister Mikhail uh, and I. And we moved around uh, pretty frequently until we settled on a small house in Ward 3. Ward 3 is the wealthiest ward in the District of Columbia. It has, by and large, the, well, the best resourced public schools. And so my mother very much targeted that area uh, in order to ensure that we would benefit from the best education. It wasn't too long uh, uh, before I noticed through playing sports around the city um, that I had advantages that my teammates did not. And I can tell you, I will never forget this girl in seventh grade who wanted to take every single class with me and she wanted to sit next to me. I was just a shy kid uh, that made me feel very awkward. And so one day I got my courage up and I asked her, why, do you, why are you always following me? And why do you wanna sit next to me in every class? And she told me something that halted me. She said, because Carl, I know you're going places. And the reason she said that was because honestly, my zip code had things going on like clean parks, like responsible adults at the parks, fully stocked libraries, adults and, and even teens who were modeling great behavior um, for me. And I realized then and through my travels playing basketball that kids who were every bit as talented as I were not supported in the same way. They had violence, they had poor modeling, and in many ways, they saw that their future was less hopeful. The second profound experience I had was when I worked as a public defender in the District of Columbia. Somehow, some way, the great professor, Amani Davis, made a hiring mistake, uh, and that allowed me to come on in. <laughs> and I just remember focusing so much on my juvenile clients, of course, working on issues of guilt and innocence, but my forte really was in digging in and trying to understand what was underneath that tip of the iceberg. So a crime, an act, violence, no one wants to see that. What that is is the tip of the iceberg. Underneath the iceberg are a plethora of issues that young people go through that severely impact the choices that they make and their view of the opportunities that they have before them. And so I knew with my hundreds of juvenile clients that these young people were potential stars, were certainly potential law-abiding adults, and that everything we did needed to be focused on getting them to the point where they can become contributing adults uh, to our great city. Those are my two personal experiences um, that fully animate the work I do every day on behalf of the District of Columbia. Thank you. And I will say that uh, I don't think my friend and colleague, Professor Davis, ever makes any mistakes. <laughs> I'm confident she didn't make one uh, with you. So um, I will now turn to the, uh, uh, the Q&A where we have some really excellent questions. Um, ah, uh, and uh, Professor Davis tells me that hiring you was one of the wisest decisions she made at PDS. So I, oh, thank uh, you. Uh, <laughs> she's obviously, uh, you know, on this uh, Zoom as I knew she would be. Uh, so first question uh, is some people are posting anonymously, which is fine. If it's a name, I'll read it out. Uh, how do law schools prime students to think about juvenile justice? In what ways is 
uh, legal education conducive to effective juvenile justice? And in what ways is it not? Um, I, I will sort of, I think, turn to different folks in the group. I think everyone should answer it. I think I'll turn first to Professor Taylor Thompson on that question. Then we'll turn to Professor Henning and then to Attorney General Racine. So um, thank you. Um, I think that uh, if we think about what law schools can do, um, I, I guess I wanna say first, we can start in your criminal law courses in the basic foundation courses, exposing students who are required to take that course to the, the concepts of um, justice and how race impacts and, and may lead to injustice with respect to kids. I, I, obviously, we want to train people who are going to ultimately want to do this work representing young people in the uh, justice system or even um, working as prosecutors, but we want to get everyone to really think about what these issues are because um, uh, it's important for us as a, as a society to actually create systems that are fairer than they are now. So one of the things that I do in my criminal law class is introduce our students to concepts of race, how race misshapes these perceptions. I introduce them to um, brain science around kids in explaining some of the cases like Roper v. Simmons um, and um, other cases that the Supreme Court has issued that affect um, our notion of punishment. Um, and then when it gets to the clinical students, uh, the students who've actually made the choice to do this work, what I do is I spend time with them and place them in situations where they're representing student uh, kids in the adult system. I expose them to the information, the science and the um, other kind of information that they need to understand the developmental issues that um, kids face. And we also try to get our students to think about the importance of changing the narrative. So we expose them to writing op-eds, um, to e examining what the legislation is that might affect kids and proposing alternatives to that legislation. So it's not just one arrow um, in your quiver, but you've got lots of ways of addressing these issues. That would be my response. And I, I'll jump in and just say, I, I honestly, I think Professor Taylor Thompson, she covered it all quite, quite well. The only thing that I would add is I think as we in this country are focused so acutely on police reform, right, and reform in the criminal legal system, it is essential that we do not forget the unique ways in which policing and criminalization impact adolescents. And so I think all of the things that um, Professor Taylor Thompson talked about, the teaching of the adolescent brain and the impact of race is, is critically important. And as, as I use the word critically, <laughs> uh, we can't ignore critical race theory. Um, and you know, even if you don't name it as such, the, the, the curriculum must incorporate the impact of race and helping students understand how structural racism impacts adolescents and particularly in the criminalization of their normal behaviors. I think that is so important to think about the policies, the institutions, the laws, the norms that seem neutral on their face but yet are deeply impacted by race, right? Either in implementation or in the writing. It also makes me think about, or in the design, I should say, in the writing of the laws, um, but it also makes me think about historically. And as I was doing research um, for my book, The Rage of Innocence, um, I learned so much about the ways in which race impacted the evolution of certain key institutions um, in our country. For example, the ways in which race shaped and guided the evolution of school resource officers in um, uh, or of the evolution of resource officers in schools, right? Like that is very much a racialized history, quite different than the narrative that we are often told, which is we have police in schools because of, of the mass shooting in Columbine, right? So we've got to rewrite or uh, clarify, um, give light to the true history of, of these critical questions. And one last example of that is even the evolution of adolescence, 
the very um, developmental stage of adolescence is has its own racialized history. Um, and so we need to know that history as we do this work, as we think about law, as we think about what it means to be a lawyer. So I co-sign everything that, um, that uh, Professor Kim Taylor Thompson does in her clinic. I think that's just phenomenal. I think I would add uh, just a couple of thoughts to um, both professors' excellent comments. And that is, um, don't forget about the young people themselves. Go out, ask them questions, listen to them. There are um, extraordinary groups, unfortunately, really poorly resourced, um, but extraordinary groups of young people out here who are talking about the very issues that we're talking about. And time after time after time, if you listen carefully uh, to our young folks, what they say is the following. My neighbor, my friend, person who's not even my friend, but goes to the same school, what they need are counselors. They need help to remove the stigma from getting help because there's stuff going on at home. There's bullying going on at school. When they try to do the right thing, they may in some instances be criticized for trying to do the right thing. We know that actually, no matter what we think, it's young people who influence young people. And so getting proximate with young people and listening to what they say they need is an important part of the puzzle that we don't do enough of as adults. I would also add that in the District of Columbia, it's a city that is extremely well-resourced there nonetheless is a massive deficiency of structured activity, including unstructured creativity um, under the guidance of responsible adults uh, in out of school time. And so if a kid is not being productive or learning or being creative, or, or otherwise participating in a positive social engagement after school? Well, I'm here to tell you, there's a lot of things, stolen cars, carjackings and the like to get into. And so we adults have to do a much better job of listening and then putting the resources into those out of school services that I benefited from when I was a kid. Thank you. Another excellent question. This one, I think any any one of you could weigh in on. Um, and I think I won't call on folks as the moderator. I think folks can just jump in. So here's the question from Miranda Carnes. America overcriminalizes Black children. How does this trend uniquely affect Black girls or LGBTQ plus youth? I'll jump in there real quick. I, I think that's exactly right. I, uh, Chris writes uh, beautifully in her book uh, about her experience as a uh, criminal defense lawyer in DC over 25 years. I believe, um, uh, Chris, that you recounted that you believe you defended four uh, white youth uh, during that time. I'm here to tell you at the Office of Attorney General as the prosecutor uh, for juveniles, I I've not seen more than two uh, enter the system in my seven years. And let me just say, these are thousands and thousands of cases each year. And so what does that mean? Um, it certainly doesn't mean that our fellow white child um, is just simply staying at the library and reading all day. No, I think what it means is that when a, a white kid who's well-resourced, and to be sure, this can also apply to um, brown and black kids who are well-resourced, um, they're off-ramps. Folks may not even call the police. Um, when they do call the police, the police will be more apt to work something out uh, that doesn't include going to the station if uh, the, the child has a home and the parent is there and the parent assures the child that the officer that something is going to be worked through. And so there are those massive disparities. I think a proxy for this is uh, the arrest uh, around uh, marijuana offenses. We know that um, Black and brown 
use marijuana at just about the same level uh, as our white brothers and sisters. We also know that brown and black are about eight times more likely to be arrested uh, for marijuana offenses. So disparities are absolutely real uh, and it has to be something that a prosecutor considers uh, when assessing whether to bring a case uh, into uh, the system. I think I'll leave my comment there and uh, defer to the professors. So let me jump in and say a word about girls. So thank you, um, uh, you know, Attorney General, for you know lifting up the criminalization of Black youth. I mean, profound. Two kids in your seven years as Attorney General, and when I talk about four kids, four Black kids only that I've represented, that's over 26 years, and three out of that four were very early in my career. Um, really early in my career. So, which shows that the, the racial disparities have only gotten worse each and every year. And that's a really critical in point. Let me say a word about girls, because I know folks are interested in the, and the question call for that as well. I so appreciate that question because I think when we talk about the criminalization of black adolescents and um, policing, we are thinking largely about boys. And we cannot forget as Professor Taylor Thompson noted, that the stereotypes and biases that we have about Black children are uh, uh, impact and apply to Black girls as well, right? And so there is um, bias that leads folks to overstate the sexuality of Black children, of Black girls in particular, in ways that paint them as deviant, sexually deviant. There are um, the stereotypes about Black children being um, older and more uh, dangerous than they actually are also apply to Black girls as well. And so as a result of that, we have seen high profile cases of Black girls um, being hurt and injured by the police and arrested by the police. The nine-year-old girl who is pepper sprayed, nine years old, pepper sprayed in New York in the snow, right? We've got um, Taylor Bracey, who's a 17-year-old girl in Florida who's body slammed onto the concrete at her school by a school resource officer. All of that arises from this research showing that adults tend to view Black girls as less innocent, and this is really critical, less in need of protection, right? You would never I'm going to be quite blunt. You would never see a police officer grab a, a, a young, cute little white girl with pigtails and body slam her onto the, the, the sidewalk. It just wouldn't happen. And I think we have to be honest about being that blunt and that explicit about it, right? Um, we respond differently. So Black girls are perceived as less innocent, less um, uh, need of protection, older, more mature, more knowledgeable about all things, including sex. And that study, let me be clear, um, was done by Georgetown Law Center's um, Center on Poverty and Inequality. That is not my center. So I appreciate the shout out, uh, <laughs> Professor Kim Taylor Thompson, but that was my colleague at Georgetown who did that study, but we all rely on it because it's so incredibly important. The final thing that I really wanna say, so not only are black girls um, susceptible to um, victimization as a result of those implicit biases that, uh, that harm black boys, but then also black girls have the added anxiety and stress and depression of watching their brothers, their sisters, their cousins, their, um, their fathers, their uncles, their grandfathers ripped away from the home, right? Um, because of this criminalization. So you think about the, um, the young people who have seen their, their, their siblings or their fathers shot in front of them and are growing up that way. So we have to also add that um, to the equation. Um, and so I'll stop there, you know, maybe someone else can speak on the, the LGBTQ issues, yeah. Yeah, so I was gonna mention that um, one of the things that we see in so many schools is bullying based on sexual identity. Right. And school officials often ignore the effects of that bullying until, and sort of miss the trauma and the effects of that trauma until the person who's been bullied reacts violently. Then all of a sudden everybody swoops in and wants to create um, you know, a response to that. And, and what's happened in, in those cases is that the kids 
who are experiencing that level of bullying often feel like they have to fend for themselves. There's just nobody protecting them. And so they'll do things that they think will protect themselves, like you know, bringing a, a, a knife to school or doing something that they think is self-protective. And then when things unravel, um, they end up getting arrested. One of the things that we're seeing is that, and, and uh, Professor Henning has mentioned this, Attorney General Racine has mentioned this, is that we are lacking that counseling function in schools. Um, there was a study that came out a few years ago that says that four out of, ten, uh, out of the 10 largest public school districts, New York City, Chicago, Miami-Dade, Houston, uh, schools, security officers, police, outnumber school counselors in those districts. It's just a stunning um, report. And, and that's what we allow. We, we view, we misread trauma, view bad behavior as criminal behavior, as opposed to responses to layering of traumas. And, and then we target those kids and kick them out of school. The, the school to prison pipeline begins so early for kids and, and for kids of color. Um, and as kids move from childhood into adolescence, you start, they start to experience discriminatory discipline. Parents of black boys refer to this as this shared experience as fourth grade syndrome. In fourth grade is where we start seeing this difference. So yeah, there's a lot that needs to be done to really rethink how all of our institutions that touch children can be re-examined and changed so that we are not shoveling people into the justice system where they do not belong. So Professor Taylor Thompson's remarks sort of lead into a both the back, back pocket question I had for Professor Henning and also one that popped up a variant of this in the Q&A, which is what are alternatives to policing in school that can keep our schools safe? And the uh, person who asked this question in the Q&A is um, Patrick Riley. Um, and particularly as we return to more in-person learning during the uh, uh, as we, as perhaps the pandemic lessens, uh, this may be a particularly pressing question. Yes. So I would say, I mean, I, I think, let me put a finer point on some things that have already been said. We really need to shift from traditional law enforcement approaches to a holistic public health approach to safety, and that is safety in schools as well as safety in the community. And that public health approach needs to be relational, meaning that it needs to be attentive to the relationship between adults and children. It needs to be racially just because we need to be clear that the children are watching and they know that they are being treated disparately. Um, it needs to be restorative as um, uh, Attorney General Carr Racine has indicated, meaning it needs to teach and engage young people in the resolution of conflicts, right? And it needs to be trauma responsive. So what does that mean in concrete terms? Some of the things that we've already heard, it means we have to shift our, law, our dollars from law enforcement to mental health providers in schools. So that means counselors, that means social workers, that means mental health professionals um, in the building. And especially, I think this is always true, but it's especially true. And I believe I saw the question and it also referenced, especially as children come back from a pandemic. So not only do they have the trauma of, of, of living in heavily uh, police neighborhoods, but now they have the trauma of the pandemic. And so we've got to have uh, mental health providers on staff. Um, who are also culturally sensitive though, right? Not pathologizing our children and over-labeling our children of color. But that said, we also need um, peer intervention. We need positive uh, behavior supports. These are, you know, uh, Attorney General Racine talked about evidence-based approaches. There is a wealth of literature on what works. Social emotional learning in schools. Again, focusing on that uh, conflict resolution, empathy development, mm -hmm. social skills that allow folks to engage with one another, um, restorative justice. And so folks say to me, wait, so we're going to do all of that and our schools are going to be safer. Yes, <laughs> the research shows there's a direct correlation with these types of programs, right? This type of focus, this public health focus, um, in contrast to the harmful effects 
of policing. In fact, policing makes us less safe. First of all, just the mere presence of police officers makes black and brown children feel less safe, right? Feel that they are targeted. And as um, Attorney General Racine talked about, you go to school and you can't concentrate, you can't focus, you can't calm down, right? Because you walk in and you see police officers in the school who look just like the police officers you saw out on the street, right? So it increases stress and anxiety instead of reducing stress and anxiety, especially for black and brown children, right? Also police in schools means more arrests. More arrest means more arrest of black students, right? More arrest of black students means more uh, trauma um, and increases the risk that a child will drop out of school, lost instruction time and the like. So there are, um, there's a wealth of literature on how we get there um, without police. Thanks very much. Um, I have another question in the chat about restorative justice and a situation where perhaps a young person does not want to participate in restorative justice efforts, what happens uh, and how is that um, situation dealt with? And is there a potential for coercion in the, in actually in the restorative justice process um, when it comes to, especially, particularly to young, young people? Sure, uh, Benny, um, it's a great question. Uh, first of all, uh, the way we, you know, we follow the restorative justice protocols at the Office of Attorney General, um, we only proceed with restorative justice if the victim wants to go forward with it. And if at any time in the process, the victim wants to cease the restorative justice um, engagement, we're out. And so it really is giving the keys to the victim. And in regards to the potential for coercion or manipulation uh, subtly or, or more aggressively uh, in the circles, what we call it, I want you to know that it's not as if the victim comes in, chooses restorative justice, <clears throat> and within the next hour is confronting the victim. Not at all. There's a lot of work done in advance of the victim and the offender uh, working together. And that is that there are sessions held uh, with our trained restorative justice leaders and the victim, separate trainings held with the offender and our trained restorative justice professionals so that we talk about fear, we talk about consequences, we talk about what's going to happen in the room, that their support groups are with them um, all of this leads to, and I've, we have got data on this, we've asked every single victim who's gone through restorative justice, would they recommend restorative justice to someone who was similarly victimized? 98% of the victims said yes. We asked the same question of the offender. Would you recommend RJ to someone that got into some stuff like you did, 97% said yes. The reason, why? Because this is a way for our community to heal, for us to come together. Because as, as prof the professors both know, there's a fine line, particularly in the District of Columbia, between being a victim of crime and being accused of a crime. Oftentimes, the victim and the offender know each other. Even frequently, the victim and the offender are part of the same community. Rather than allow a beef to fester and retaliation to ensue, why not go through a process of understanding, acceptance of responsibility, apology, and then restorative acts to make the community stronger? That's the prospect of restorative justice. And I wanna say that I would love to see that restorative justice become the default way of dealing with juveniles in the juvenile justice system, even as we have cases that are serious cases, murder cases that have to be tried. Majority of cases, I believe, can be dealt through diversion with services 
and through restorative justice. Thank you. I see that we're nearly out of time. I don't think anyone's going to pull out the hook, or maybe Sarah will. I wanted, though, to give uh, <laughs> that Sarah's job. I know because she's a student of mine in the clinic. Uh, uh, Professor Ta Taylor Thompson and Professor Henning, uh, just a quick chance to jump in and any thoughts that you might have on on the question of restorative justice and its, uh, you know, it the its uh, its challenges. It, right, and it challenges. You know what, I have to say this, that, um, so I, um, as was indicated in my bio, I uh, direct the juvenile justice clinic, which means that I am still in court actively representing uh, children who are prosecuted by my wonderful friend, <laughs> Attorney General Carl Racine. And I have to say in the, and I say it when um, Attorney General Racine is not in the room, the restorative justice program in Washington, D.C is indeed affected. It is indeed, it does indeed do exactly what um, uh, the attorney general describes. Our children benefit from it. Um, and indeed, as he says, that if a child um, does not wish to participate, they do not participate. It's got to be mutual on both sides. I do want to acknowledge what I think what Professor Miller is getting at is that it is not always implemented, implemented across the country with That's fidelity, right? right? Um, and that th there is the risk. I, I am a, a, a fa in favor of restorative justice across the country. However, I worry about the ways in which um, there's a power dynamic between the adults who run the restorative justice program and children. So you basically, you get a group of adults in the room with the kid and basically get the kid to confess I did wrong and I need to fix, which works if it's done well in the ways in which um, it is done in DC. And I'm happy, you know, uh, really to talk to anybody about how it works well in DC, um, but we have to remember the race dynamic is still at play in restorative justice, power dynamic between adults and children is still in, in play, that the folks who run the restorative justice really have to understand um, adolescent development. One of the things that I love about what you just said at the end, Attorney General Racine, is understanding that restorative framework, even when serious offenses. Um, well, that's right. Are in play. And well, so and I the data, that. as you know, Professor, the data actually shows um, that RJ is more effective um, the more serious the offense. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, you got to be bold here. That's right. Uh, and you've got to go ahead and be willing to bring innovation to the most serious offenses. That's right. And don't take it from me. Um, the National Victims uh, Rights Group in DC, NVRDC, um, they bestowed um, one of the greatest honors I could ever receive on behalf of my colleagues to our restorative justice program. This is a group that focuses on protecting victims. Uh, they analyzed our program and they indicated that this is the kind of pro-victim approach um, that needs to be uh, copied throughout the country. Let me just make two points quickly. The RJ in our office is the only restorative justice program housed in a prosecutor's office in the United States of America. Um, Sima Gajwani, another former public defender in DC, there's a theme here, um, <laughs> uh, is the captain of our team. We're also very fortunate to have won a significant grant uh, from the Department of Justice that will allow us to double the size of the program this year. And we're not going to be uh, rushed in the hiring because it's important that we hire people who, as Professor Henning indicated, understand the proper framework to understand how to work with our children. I think I'm going to let both Professor Henning's comments and Attorney General Racine's comments be the last word since I realize that we've run over and Sarah's smiling but wants us to stop. So thank you for inviting us. I think that the important thing is that we really do think about restorative justice as part of a larger set of reforms that need to take place. We need to reduce the punitive footprint of this system and we need to start building the instead. We're, we're, we're locking up people. What's instead? What's going to happen instead? We need to build that. Thank you very much. And I will just add that these presentations were fantastic. They spoke to my heart and also to my head. And I think we need hope always, 
uh, I think we especially need hope in these times. And I think effective transformations are all about hope. And uh, I'm just so happy to been, have been a part of this. Thank you all. Thank you very Thank you. much. Thank you all again. Um, we spoke a lot today about school policing, wanted to plug that we are really pumped that American University Law Review, it will be publishing a piece called A Health Justice Response to School Discipline and Policing by Talia Gonzalez, Alexis Ito, and Cesar mm -hmm. de la Vega. And um, we are, they unfortunately could not be a part of the symposium, but we will be having a conversation with them with the WCL's Health Law and Policy Program. Um, and that will be published to the um, AULR's YouTube page uh, in the next couple of weeks. So stay on the lookout if you're interested in the topic. And thank you again, Professor Kim Taylor Thompson, Professor Henning, and Attorney General Racine. We really appreciate all of your time and Professor Miller for moderating this absolutely incredible discussion. Um, we will come back with a different link in uh, 25 minutes for our keynote address from Donnell Drinks. And we look forward to seeing you all then. Yep. Thank Thanks to the audience too. We couldn't get to all of your amazing questions, but um, they were great. Thank you, everyone.